Perhaps you're going through something right now. Maybe there's a challenge in your marriage or you receive a bad medical report from the doctor and you find that the need in your life is overwhelming to meet the vastness of the need in your life. Well, my friend, the answer is here. You might say that I'm a face in a crowd. Well, he preached to the multitude, to the crowd. And yet, he took time because he knew there was one here that needed him. And Jesus came all the way here just for that one person. And friend, he'll do that for you. At the very top of Mount Arbel, where I believe Jesus would frequent in times of aloneness with the Father, times of seeking the Father, hearing His wisdom, His voice, I believe that this is the place that He will come to. Even after the feeding of the 5,000, the, the Word of God says Jesus came up to the high mountain and from here, he saw the disciples whom he sent away. After the feeding of the 5,000, he sent them away to go to the city of Bethsaida. And he saw them from here. As you can see, I love coming here because, you know, you, from here you can see three-fourths of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. His ministry of preaching, teaching, and healing took place in this vicinity. And right at the end, where these parallel banks meet, just to the right is Capernaum, where Jesus would frequent, and it's known as the town of Jesus even today. And it's a place called, in Hebrew, Kafir Nahum, the town of comfort, because Comforter is the name of the Messiah, and He has come. So, as we look at this beautiful place here, in Mount Arbel, drinking the sights, knowing that our Lord was here and spending time with the Father. Let us see all the truths that He wants us to receive, especially the now word for His people at this time. Let's turn to the Word of God in regards to the feeding of the 5,000, which many of you are familiar with. I believe the location for the feeding of the 5,000 took place just on the other side of Mount Arabelle, all the way down the slopes. And today you can see a vast field of barley. It's a time nearly for the barley harvest. But I believe that back then it was deserted and this whole place here was deserted, except for Migdal down the hill, down the mountain here, and then Tiberius was around, but besides that, there's no other city. Today is busy, it's bustling, but I believe that this area here was a deserted place. And the Bible says that Jesus saw there were so many people and they were pressing in to hear His word, and the day wore off, and now they were hungry. Isn't it amazing that the one that took note of their hunger wasn't the disciples, it was the Lord Himself. He knows when you are hungry. He knows that that hunger is for more than just um, materialism or hedonistic pursuits or entertainment to fill up that void, that hunger, because there's a hunger in your heart that is too large. Your heart is just too large for all these small things to fill. Only the Lord Jesus can fill your heart. He's large enough. In fact, He's too large for your heart. Just like in the, in the Song of Songs, the Bible says that the Beloved in that song loves all of us and our Beloved is our Lord Jesus, but we are the Beloved also in that Song of Songs. But Ecclesiastes talk about vanity of vanities, this world. It's just empty. Every pursuit, every pursuit for pleasure, entertainment, uh, uh, fi riches and wealth, fame and fortune, just comes up empty. Why? Because Ecclesiastes is all about life under the sun and it's vanity. Everything is just empty because your heart is too big for the things of the world to satisfy. But the next book, Song of Songs, our Lord Jesus, we found the object above the sun, an object fit 
for our heart's pleasure and delight. Even though he, now we find He's too large for our small hearts. But we found the fulfillment in Him. And He was here at Mount Arabel, seeing the needs of the people down there in the slopes in that area. Now some might say that the feeding of the 5,000 took place in Bethsaida in Luke chapter 9, the account of the feeding of the 5,000. But actually, if you read carefully, it says it was a desert place in a place belonging to Bethsaida. It doesn't say it is over at Bethsaida, right in the north of the, um, the Lake of Galilee, over yonder. But it was a place belonging to the city of Bethsaida. So there are towns that have properties and areas and fields that belong to them, even though they are many miles away. So I believe that that answers to the place here because after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus went up the mountain. So let's look at the account here in the Word of God because I believe God has a word for you. And, and the Bible says that Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that this may eat? But this he said to test him for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread. 200 denarii worth of bread is 200, uh, 200 days wages. 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may have a little. Now think about that, that everyone may have a little. So in the mentality of uh, Philip, it is even 200 days wage of bread will not supply these people here, 5,000 men, but including women and children, probably 15,000. So he's saying that each one can only receive a little. So he's thinking of the vastness of the need. Perhaps you're going through something right now. Maybe there's a challenge in your marriage or you receive a bad medical report from the doctor and you find that the need in your life is overwhelming. You don't, you, you, you can't see the supply. You can't see the, the resources that you need because you are captured by the vastness of the need. So that's Philip's perspective. And the Lord was there all the time. And then Andrew, another disciple, he said to Jesus, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? So now he's saying, Look at this boy, you know, he probably wanted to humor the boy by bringing the boy to Jesus. He says he has five loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? So now, Andrew's perspective, and perhaps is what some of us see as well, he sees the smallness, the littleness of the supply. Five loaves, two fish, look at the vastness of the need. What are they among so many? Perhaps you are overwhelmed by the littleness of your resources. You say that I don't have much education. I, I didn't really finish high school even. Or, you know, I don't have the kind of strength or the help that I need. I'm overwhelmed by the meagerness, by the littleness of the supply. Or may, perhaps you find that you're challenged in the area of finance and um, the supply has been has been little, as far as you are concerned, to meet the vastness of the need in your life. Well, my friend, the answer is here. The very first thing Jesus said, make the people sit down. So sitting down, yeshaf in Hebrew, is always the first thing you do before a miracle happens. In fact, he organized them in groups of 50s and all throughout the place, he made them sit down in group of 50s and five is a number of grace. He organized, so there's, there's also organization before the miracle. They are not antithesis to each other. You can organize and still expect God's anointing. Some people think the anointing comes without any planning and all that. So you can still plan, but make sure it's wise planning. So the very first thing is they sit down, just like Psalms 91, before all the blessings come. No evil shall befall you. No plague will come near your dwelling. You shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the destruction that lays waste at noonday. My friend, all this happens because of the first verse. He who dwells in the secret place. And in the Hebrew, he who sits down. Yashaf, he who sits down. So the very first thing Jesus said, 
make the people sit down. But, you know, you might feel like, sit down, I, I, I can't rest because of the greatness, the vastness of my need. I, I can't rest because when I look at what I have, uh, I look at myself, I have very little. I have not much to supply the need in my life. Well, the first thing, you have to trust the ways of the Lord. He wants you to rest. Rest from your cares, worries, and concerns. And then the Bible says the next thing, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000 and Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Now in Luke's account of this feeding of the multitude, you find Jesus giving thanks and then he broke it and gave. The word gave there in the Greek is in the imperfect tense, which means he kept giving, he kept supplying. And the disciples keep coming back. They, they, they would take some loaves and fish and they would go to the people and give it to them. And then he'll, they'll come back for more. 12 disciples coming to Jesus for more. And he just kept on giving. As long as there was a need, the supply never ran out. And this is beautiful, friend, because the Bible says, likewise of the fish as much, as much as they wanted, not according to God's will, and God says enough, according to God's, uh, um, you know, law that says only such an amount can be supplied. No, as much as they wanted. They limited the supply the moment they say, we are full. The Bible says, when they were filled, Jesus told the disciples, pick up the fragments that remain. You know what? There were 12 baskets full left over. One for each disciple. They were serving the Lord. If you are serving the Lord, let me tell you this, your supply is vast. Your supply is great. Amen. More than you can eat. But it was after they were filled. Notice, as long as they were hungry, they kept on eating as much as they wanted. Amen. Many a times we limit the Holy One of Israel. We limit the Lord. His supply is greater than our need. You need to see that. Where sin increase? And sometimes we are so overwhelmed by the sin in, in this young generation and we are saying, man, they, you know, they, they experience things we don't experience in our age and all that. But my friend, where sin increase? Grace! Super abounds. Let's be more conscious of His grace than sin. Let's be more conscious of His supply because grace is supply. Law is demand. Law says, you shall not, you shall not. Grace says, I will do this for you. I will forgive you your sins. I'll put my laws in your heart and in your mind. I'll supply you. I'll give you the know-how. I'll give you the wisdom. Amen. What do you have to do? Sit down. Just receive, be in a posture of rest. I know during these times, as you look at what the world is going through, this financial famine, we thank God in all the famines of the Word of God, our Lord's resources are greater. God's people always thrive during times of famine. Be it Abraham, be it Isaac, Isaac sowed in the land of, in the year of famine, in the very year of famine, and he reaped a hundredfold. So friend, God's supply, I hope you have this picture right now, God's supply is greater than your need. Look to Him alone and be at rest. You know, this position of sitting down before the Lord is something so precious because friend, when you sit before the Lord, it's not just sitting to the Lord, sit before the Lord and looking at Him. How do I look at Him, Pastor Prince? You look at Him in the Word of God. Right now, I'm ex expounding the Word of God, but it's all about Jesus. When you see Jesus in the Word, just like on the road of Emmaus, the disciples were cast down, dejected, discouraged, and the Lord came, and the Lord restrained their eyes from seeing who He was. And He talked to them about the Scriptures, and He began to, to talk to them about, about the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, and they were, they were sad and discouraged. But notice what happened. He began to expound in them the things concerning Himself. That's how you see Jesus today. You see Him in the Word. 
all the laws in the Old Testament, all the ceremonies, even the characters in the Bible, they typify Christ. Amen. Jesus is in the shadows in the Old Testament. Let's see Him and let the Holy Spirit bring Him out in all His beauties, glories and excellencies. Just like you see Him right now on Mount Arbel. Where? In the Word. Amen. I'm standing at the very location where Jesus, I believe, went up the mountain. Right after He fed the people, He came up the mountain and He sent the disciples away to go to Bethsaida. He sent the people away and then He came up the mountain and here He prayed. It's a picture of our Lord. Right now, where is He? He's in the kingdom of God. He is in heaven. He's in the mountain where He's interceding for us and He was praying here. And if you look behind me, you'll find that the Lake of Galilee here and Capernaum right at the end where I'm pointing, right? So he sent his disciples down. There is a trail that I used to take with my pastors down this trail. It's an ancient trail. I believe that's a trail that Jesus took. When he saw them rowing and in the fourth watch of the night, the Bible tells us, there's the darkest time from 3 a.m to 6 a.m. It was always darkest before dawn. That's the darkest period. Jesus looked at them and they were rowing against the wind. There was a strong wind that came, came in and pushed them back. And it's like a picture of our Lord today at the Father's right hand. And He's looking at the church. Friend, He's looking at you. He's looking at the, the, the body of Christ. In spite of what is happening in the world, we are in the world, but not of the world. Our resources don't have an expiry date. Our resources are inexhaustible because they are found in Him. So look to Him alone. And He saw them struggling against the wind. It's like, you know, taking three steps forward, then two steps backward. And the Bible says, in the darkest time, Jesus came down the mountain, walked on the water, and went towards the disciple. And they were afraid they because it was dark, it was stormy, just imagine that. And this I experienced fisherman, but it was the darkest time in the darkest time of your life. Look out for Jesus. You may not see Him the way you, you expect, but He is there. He will always come to you. You see, grace is about Him coming to us, not about men trying to reach Him on Mount Sinai, men trying with His efforts, men by His law keeping, men by His good intentions. No, Jesus came down the mountain. Amen. When Moses came down the mountain with the law, the people fled. But when Jesus came down the mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration, He came down the mountain, the people ran towards Him. There's something about grace, something about Lord Jesus that attracts us, that the law cannot. And when He came down to them and they shouted, they were afraid, Jesus says, It is I, be not afraid. Now in, in Hebrew, He would have said, I am. In fact, in the original Greek even, it says, I am. I am. al tira. In Hebrew means, don't be afraid. I am. Now, the moment he says, I am, the disciples knew. He is claiming deity. The God at the burning bush who spoke to Moses when Moses asked him the question, who shall I say sent me? When the children of Israel asked me, who is this God? And God says, I am that I am. So Jesus, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing nowadays, uh, even among some people here in Israel, believers even, who don't believe in the deity of Jesus, my friend, don't ever fall into the trap. And Jesus is fully God, He is fully man. And here He says, I am. And they receive Him. May you also receive Him into your boat. And the Bible says this, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, the moment they receive him into the boat, the Bible says, immediately they were at the land where they were going. He's the Lord of time and space. Immediately they were at the destination. Now that's supernatural. That's a miracle that sometimes get passed by. But I want you to take hold of that. Whatever you're dreaming of, whatever you are, you are, you are focus on to accomplish for the Lord in your life. You need the Lord in your life. Invite Him. And the way you do that is every day, just spend time with the Lord. 
be relaxed, be at peace, be at rest, and see Jesus. Well, Pastor Prince, just seeing Jesus, things happen? Yes. That's what God told Moses when there was no way. He made a way through the Red Sea, but what did He say? Don't be afraid. al tira, Moses, see the salvation of the Lord. Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But who is the salvation of the Lord? Yeshua. Literally, the, the word salvation there is Yeshua. And He's telling Moses, Moses, you want a way through this overwhelming odds? I'll make a way for you, but you need to not be afraid. Be at rest. And I'll make a way for you. What? Make a way where there's no way against all impossible odds? Yes. Fear not. Stand still and see. See Yeshua. Just seeing Yeshua, the sea opened. My friend, when you see Jesus, good things begin to happen in your life. And the disciples at the end of the Emmaus Road says, you know, when He opened up the Scriptures to us, and how did He open up Scriptures? He opened up from the Old Testament things concerning Himself. So we don't study the Bible to, to find what to do, what to do, you know. And that's a perspective that many of us are brought up on. What to do now. What to do will come into play. Don't worry about what to do. See Jesus. See Jesus in the Scriptures. And that's how Jesus taught the Word of God on the road of Emmaus, expounding in them the things concerning Himself. I pray that this has blessed you right here where we are at. It's Mount Arabel, where Jesus came up here and saw your need. So here we are at the Mount of Beatitudes, where the Lord said those famous Beatitudes, right from somewhere in this vicinity. And I believe it's somewhere around here because the, the multitudes would have been where the banana plantation right now is. You can just visualize people there. And they have done some studies here and found it amazingly acoustic. And uh, the Lord would preach and His voice would carry over. You can actually experiment when your group is here. Someone standing over here and just speak in a normal tone, it will carry over into the valley. So here's where, somewhere here, the Bible says He sat down as He taught the people. So it must be a, a spot where the people could see Him, where He was talking to the people. Could be one of these rocks over here. But what is interesting is that after He preached the Sermon on the Mount, the Bible says here, in, right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Now, there are two ways for him to come down from the mountain. One is this way, and the other will be down to where the people are. But if that was so, it wouldn't say, great multitudes followed him. Because to follow means they are behind him. He wouldn't have gone down this way. He would have gone this way. So let's see why the Lord went this way. We know that in the next chapter, it talks about the Lord entered Capernaum. And Capernaum happened to be right here in my line of sight, where I'm pointing to. That's where Capernaum is. And the multitudes were down there. So for them to follow Him, they must have seen Him st stand up. When He finished His sermon, step down and go this way. And they followed Him below the mountain as He proceeded in this pathway. So let's see what the Lord was after, what is He seeking after. Shall we? Follow me. Where we left off over there when Jesus said to speak to the people, the wonderful Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. And right after that, He proceeded this direction because the next chapter tells us when Jesus entered Capernaum. Now, where is Capernaum from here? Right over there. So in other words, we can see it's a straight line from here to where we were just now when He preached the Sermon on the Mount. So He proceeded this way because the Bible says that the multitudes followed Him. 
So in order for them to follow him, he must have walked this way and the next chapter says he entered Capernaum. But along the way, something happened. When he came down from the mountains and the multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came to him, worshiped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, some years ago, I was here and uh, I walked towards this direction. And the Lord gave me an inner vision of what happened here. And I found this uh, rock over here where the Lord was walking through and the leper was probably hiding because from here, this direction here, you can actually hear the Lord's sermon they was preaching. And when the Lord talked about, look at the birds of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? And the leper was probably behind one of these rocks perhaps, but I had the inner vision. He was behind this rock over here and he was listening. Now he cannot be found among the multitudes because if a leper was found in public, he would be stoned. So he would definitely be over here. And that tells us how our Lord left the multitudes just to proceed in this direction. He could have gone down to where they were, where the multitude were, and walked with them all the way to Capernaum. But instead, he came all the way here, all right? And the multitudes would have followed him below the valley, all right? But uh, it will take them some time because they are down there. And, and the leper was somewhere here. And when Jesus came somewhere here, and the leper came out, begging him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He was probably hiding away from the people. But there's something about Jesus that caused the leper to expose himself to him. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, he has no doubt about Jesus' ability and power, but he has a doubt about Jesus' willingness. And Jesus assured him once and for all. First of all, look at the wonderful compassion of our Lord Jesus. Look at the beauty of our Lord Jesus. The Bible says Jesus touched him. How long has it been? He's, he's been without that human touch. A touch of his family members, his child running to him, Abba, Abba, all this time that he's a leper. He's been without human touch. But Jesus, the first thing Jesus did, oh, the wonderful Savior, how beautiful he is. Jesus touched him restored to him his humanity. And then Jesus said, I'm willing. Be thou made clean. And the Bible says immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now by now, the multitude that followed Jesus below the valley there would have come up somewhere here because they all, they all know he's going towards Capernaum. But more than that, why would he take this direction towards Capernaum? He could have gone down with the multitudes to Capernaum. He came all the way here just for that leper. And that's our, our Lord Jesus. That's how compassionate He is. That's how His heart goes out for that one person. You might, you might say that I'm a face in a crowd. Well, He preached to the multitude, to the crowd. And yet, He took time because He knew there was one here that needed Him. One lost soul. One person who felt like, I know He has a power, but does He know where I am? Does He care what I'm going through? And Jesus came all the way here just for that one person. And friend, He'll do that for you. Now, don't ask me how it's done. He knows, he, he, he pays attention. He knows the number of hairs on your head as if you're the only person in the world. And the Lord is right in front of you saying, if you ever doubt, I'm willing to use my power on your behalf. Doubt no more. I am willing. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Bible says that right after that, Jesus entered Capernaum. And what happened to the leper? He was cleansed. He was cleansed so he could join the multitude and not worry being stoned. He was as normal as any, anyone else. And they never could tell the difference. And the man went back to his family. He went back to his friends. He went back to his profession. He became a normal person, feeling, most of all, fully human, fully alive because of Jesus. And friend, He can do that for you. If you just welcome Him into, into your life, friend, Jesus makes the unclean clean. You see, 
If you were under the law, the law would condemn the leper. The leper cannot be seen in public. He'll be stoned. In fact, he has to put a mask, and we're all familiar with masks these few years. He could have put a mask across his face and say, unclean, unclean. But then, when Jesus met him, now his cry is clean, clean by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. You see, under law, if you touch the unclean, you touch the leper, you become unclean. But under grace, Jesus, the clean, touched the unclean and the unclean became clean. Friend, let the Lord love you. Let the Lord touch you. Let the Lord come to you because that's what He's doing right now. He's coming to you, even through this screen, my friend. Reach out and say, Lord Jesus, I receive your love. I receive your healing. I receive your breakthrough. I thank you, Lord. You're coming to me even right now. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, be healed of that affliction. In the name of the Lord Jesus, receive the forgiveness of God and enter into new life because the Lord came all the way just to seek and to save the lost. He loves you, my friend. Isn't He wonderful? We're now at the Mount of Beatitudes where Jesus preached that sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And there's something that God has for us right here on location that I believe He wants you all to hear from His Word. And let's see a part of the Sermon on the Mount that the Lord has for us today. Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. This is a very appropriate word for the times that we are in. And what better place than here on the Mount of Beatitudes? You can look behind me and see a panoramic view of the Lake of Galilee. And Capernaum is just down there. And beyond there is Gadara, the other side. And here we are on the west coast of Galilee. The Sermon on the Mount was preached in this vicinity, somewhere in these parts here. And here is where also Jesus, right after He preached the Sermon on the Mount, He went down, the Bible says, to touch the leper and to cleanse him. And then He proceeded to go to the city of Nep, Capernaum. But the Lord says here, like I said, the word in season for us is not to worry about what, what we shall eat, what we shall drink, nor what we shall put on. We are in those times, aren't we? The people are worried about where their supply is coming from. Will they have enough for tomorrow, for their children, for their education? And I believe that the Lord has wisdom for us that He wants us to apply to our lives, even from this Sermon on the Mount, which is so contemporary even for today, for the world we live in. This is the word in season. Don't worry about your supply and the supply will be there. In essence, that's what the Lord is saying. He's saying, don't worry about your body. Don't worry about your clothing, what you shall wear, what you shall eat, that's your body. But more than that, then He goes on to say, the body is more important than clothing. So I believe that's referring to your health. Isn't your health more important than the clothes you put on? No point putting on expensive, you know, branded clothes with a sick body. What is more important is health and priority. And some people don't feel like God prioritizes that, but He does. He says, it's not the body more than clothing. It's not life more important than food. Amen. You can go without food for days, but when life is taken from you, that's it, it's gone. But Jesus gives life and life more abundantly. So what's the, the thing that He keeps on repeating in this Sermon on the Mount again and again? It is this word, do not worry. Do not worry because look at the birds of the air and you can hear the birds chirping behind us. He says right in this location, these are the descendants of those birds, right here in this location where Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Look at the lilies of the field. 
Look at all the lilies of the field. And these again are the descendants of the lilies that were there when Jesus preached. Obviously, it was referring to these lilies that are still here today. And he says, look at how they are clothed. And he says that God clothes them and they are here today and gone tomorrow. So God cares to clothe the lily of the field. And he says that these lilies of the field, he, he went on to say, they are better clothed than Solomon in all his glory. Now, in what way is the lily better clothed than Solomon in all his glory, in all his wealth, in all the lavishness that he, he puts on himself and around him? In what way is the humble lily better than Solomon, clothed better in one sense? Solomon had to put his clothing from outside in. The lily has his clothing from the inside out. Again, I believe he's referring to your shalom, wellness, and wholeness, peace, and health. I believe, my friend, that if you don't worry, your health will spring forth speedily. So even if you've been given a bad diagnosis by the doctor, amen, don't worry about it, amen. There, there was a, a, a true story once of a man who overheard a doctor, he had a heart attack and he was in the hospital and uh, they thought that he was unconscious. The doctor said to another doctor that this man has a wholesome gallop to his heart. Now in medical terms, that's not good. A wholesome gallop is actually something uh, not, not good for someone suffering a heart attack. But in his mind, in the layman's terms, he thought that he has a heart of a horse. From that day on, he recovered. And um, some time back, he came back to the, to the, you know, for the review, the, hospital, the, the doctor, the same doctor, he says, hey doc, I'm so glad you said that I have a heart of a wholesome gallop. And the doctor says, you heard that? That's not a good term actually. Or oh, you thought, I got, I got a heart of a horse. You see, when you believe right, you receive right. Amen. Start believing that God wants you to be healthy, whole and strong, clothed from within out. That's your health. And Jesus says, the lily of the field, God cares for them. They are here today, gone tomorrow. How much more will God clothe you better than the lilies that are better clothed than Solomon in all his wealth, in all his glory? The only thing he asks of you is this, do not worry. Do not worry and the health will spring forth speedily. Do not worry and the supply, like you see the birds, they don't have to look for food. God supplies them food. They don't have to have a bank to go to, to draw food from. God supplies them. Are you not much better than the birds of the air? Are you not better than the lilies of the field? Then he goes on to say, to repeat that, same word of wisdom to us. How many of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you're not able to do, do that which is least, why worry for the rest? Now you say, well, Pastor Prince, it's very easy for you to say, no, it's not me, it's the Lord who says it. You're saying that if I don't worry, the supply will be there. If I don't worry, my health will spring forth speedily. Exactly, that's what the Lord said. Again and again, and again, he says, don't worry. And don't worry about tomorrow. He ends up by saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Why? Tomorrow will have its own trouble. Sufficient unto day is the evil thereof. Each day has its own trouble. And God gives supply one day at a time. That's the wisdom of God. Because if everything is just put there, the supply is there for your entire month. You might not even go back to the Lord the next day but you need to go to Him, amen. Let Him love you. Have a relationship with the Lord Jesus where you allow Him to love you. You allow Him to prov provide for you. See the lilies of the field? Jesus said, look at how they grow. Notice what He said, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. In other words, they don't put in effort to grow. How they grow. He's telling us this, the way you grow spiritually, the way you grow in every area of your life is not to toil, not to put in fleshly effort, but to rest and you'll grow beautiful and beautiful in His time. Hallelujah. He ends up by saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Friend, manna in the Old Testament, manna came one day at a time. Jesus did not say, pray this prayer, give us this day our yearly bread or monthly bread. Give us this day our daily bread. 
You cannot keep the manna today for tomorrow. Like the children of Israel, some of them did that and it stank. Manna is for one day at a time. When tomorrow comes, there'll be fresh supply. Amen. Grace is all about supply. Law is all about demand. Be grace conscious. Amen. Be supply conscious. Even in the world that we live in right now, in the midst of financial famine, and a financial downturn, where people are worrying about where their resources are going to come from, will they have enough? You can just relax and not worry. Why? Are you being irresponsible? No. Your greatest responsibility is not to worry. And that's what the Lord says. When you don't worry, the supply will be there. You say, if I don't worry, nothing will happen. It's exactly the opposite. For the child of God, when you don't worry, the supply will be there, the health will be there, the provisions will be there. So in other words, what is hindering all these things from manifesting? Our worry, our fretfulness, and our anxiety. So friend, don't worry. One thing is needful. Sit at the feet of Jesus, like Mary did, and listen to His Word. Listen to His Word every day. And that's how he ended by saying, seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now, don't mistranslate that. Don't, don't think, I, I must be righteous. No, it is His righteousness, not your righteousness. His righteousness today is a gift through Christ. Amen. And what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And he underlined, that first word, righteousness, seek especially His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. In other words, my priority every day is to make sure I am in righteousness consciousness, not sin consciousness, that is to be under the law, but to be righteousness conscious, thanking the Lord that He is my righteousness and all the blessings of the righteous are mine. And David says, I've, I've been young and now I'm old, I have never seen the righteous begging for bread. Amen. The righteous are always provided for. And now you are that righteous man. You are that righteous woman, not through your own self-righteousness, but because you have received His righteousness. When you seek first the kingdom of God every day and His righteousness to make sure that you are established in that, all these things, and what are the things? No, don't spiritualize it. Jesus talked about material supply. He talks about health from within. He talks about God resourcing us. All these things will be added to you when you seek first God's kingdom and especially His righteousness. I hope this has blessed you right here from the Mount of Beatitudes overlooking the Sea of Galilee.